Hello and welcome. PDP governors ask National Assembly to override the President's veto of the Electoral Act Amendment Bill 2021 as civil society organizations want bill retransmitted to the President for assent by January the 21st. Progressive Governors Forum Chairman Atiku Baguru confirms APC National Convention will take place next month. The federal government files fresh charges, including terrorism, against detained leader of the prescribed indigenous people of Biafra, Namde Kano, as his trial resumes tomorrow. Trial of suspects involved in the invasion of Supreme Court Justice Mary Odili's home begins in Abuja as prosecution calls first witness. Last we'll have international news from our London studio. On business news tonight, Nigeria's inflation rate hits 15.63%, recording its first increase after eight months of decline as food prices continue to surge. On sports news tonight, Bayern Munich and Poland striker Robert Lewandowski wins 2021 Best FIFA Men's Player of the Year. Federal Capital Territory Administration begins enforcement of COVID-19 vaccination mandate, bars the vaccinated from their offices. All eyes are on the National Assembly ahead of its resumption of plenary tomorrow, and already various stakeholders are outlining what they believe should be prioritized by the lawmakers. We begin with the governors of the People's Democratic Party, who are urging the lawmakers to resolve the uncertainty surrounding the Electoral Act Amendment Bill, even if it means overriding the president's veto. This was part of the resolutions reached by the governors at the end of their meeting in Port Harcourt today. Their communique was read by Governor Aminu Tambuwal of Sokoto State. From far north to the south, governors elected on the platform of the People's Democratic Party began arriving at the River State Government House, a day to their first meeting in 2022. The early visitors, comprising eight governors and some national officers of the party, are treated to a gala night by their host, Governor Nyesom Wike. Thereafter, he leads them into a closed-door meeting. Four hours later, the chairman of the PDP Governors Forum and Governor of Sokoto State, Aminu Tambawal, presents the resolutions arrived at. The PDP Governors requested the National Assembly to quickly conclude deliberations on the Electoral Act Amendment, either by overriding Mr. President's veto or deleting areas of complaints. The meeting advised that the option of sustaining Mr. President's veto will lead to a quicker resolution and will deny Mr. President the opportunity to once again truncate a reformed electoral jurisprudence for Nigeria. An early concluded electoral act is vital for credible elections. The PDP governors also expressed concern about the nation's economy. The Nigerian economy has continued to deteriorate, and Nigerians have become numb and accustomed to bad economic news, as exemplified by the inconsistent and differential exchange rate regime, high interest rates, unsustainable unemployment figures, and borrowing spree some of which have not been applied to important projects. Another bad economic indicators, in particular, it is clear that the APC government is a massive failure when compared with the records of PDP in government. Governor Tambawal and his PDP colleagues at this gathering believe the time has come for young people to participate in politics, saying that's one way the nation can rediscover itself. The meeting urged eligible Nigerians of all walks of life, particularly the youth, to register en masse with INEC to exercise their franchise in the 2023 general elections. It further noted that the next election is a very consequential election that should be used to end, it and, uh, to end the dominance of very youth 
unfriendly APC government. The governors are, however, silent on issues bordering on their party's internal politics. But the body language from the gathering appears to indicate that the focus is on the PDP returning to power come 2023. Meanwhile, a coalition of civil society organizations is giving the National Assembly a date to transmit the revised copy of the Electoral Act Amendment Bill to the President, and that's on Friday, January the 21st, 2022. Addressing a news conference in Abuja, a board member of Yaga Africa, Mr. Izenwe Nwagu, also says the President is to sign the amendment law a week, or within a week of receiving it from the National Assembly. Um, as emphasized in our previous statement, the successful conduct of any election is predicated on the certainty and clarity of the election legal framework, among other factors. This is to preclude any legal uncertainties that may occasion manipulation and subversion of the electoral process. To this end, we make the following recommendations. First, in difference to the national and public interest, the Senate and House of Representatives should, upon resumption, upon resumption on Tuesday, January 18, 2022, take legislative action at its first sitting to conclude the process and retransmit the bill to, the pres to President Buhari by Friday, January 21, 2022. Secondly, the National Assembly should ensure proper scrutiny of the bill to resolve all drafting errors and cross-referencing gaps before retransmitting the bill for presidential assent. Thirdly, the president should, upon receipt of this retransmitted bill, provide his assent within a week. And as the National Assembly resumes tomorrow, expectations are high that the lawmakers would quickly attend to the Electoral Act Amendment Bill, which was rejected by the President. But beyond the Electoral Bill, we take a look at what else is to be expected from the lawmakers with a little over a year to end the life of the Ninth National Assembly. Our correspondent Terry Ikumi reports. It's the final lap for the Ninth National Assembly. The year 2022 is a pre-election year, and considering the apathy in the National Assembly, which was noticed last year, there are concerns of what dimension it will take this year, as the polity gets busier and lawmakers begin to either seek re-election or further their political careers. They have excuses of going for, for their party thing, for their re-election things, and so on. That should never get into the way of the work that they were elected to do and they're paid to do. The Constitution already spells out how many times, a minimum of how many times, both houses have to meet. They flout it. They flouted it last year. They keep flouting it. We are more or less having more of senators president. And that also is contributing to what you observe, that the attendance and participation and also is very low. You are supposed to be a committee of equals with one person among you presiding. And that person should not even have his own opinion. Those against say nay, the nays have 2021 was quite an eventful year for Parliament, passing the landmark Petroleum Industry Bill and the Electoral Act Amendment Bill. President Buhari had to decline assent to the Electoral Act Amendment Bill, opposing the compulsory inclusion of the direct primary voting system for political parties and some other cross-referencing errors. The greatest expectation from Nigerians now is for the National Assembly to quickly address the concerns and return the bill to the president for assent. Parties that want to do direct primaries should go ahead and do it. Those that want indirect primaries should do it. Send it to him to sign it. Let's have an electoral act that promises free and fair elections from this year because we're going to be having elections in some states this year. That's what I'll expect them to do on the first day that they, they resume. Meanwhile, while 2021 was laden with security-related bills and motions, 2022 may not be any different, as the President of the Senate hints. The security situation still begs for more attention. We'll give a lot of attention to the security situation. We have appropriated about a trillion for our security agencies and armed forces. Now, it is for 
members of the National Assembly to ensure that the procurement process by the armed forces are transparent and everybody there is accountable. There is one more budget for the 9th National Assembly to pass and complete the January to December budget cycle which it reintroduced. It is also obligatory for this assembly to leave a legacy that would perhaps change the narrative and perception of lawmakers. Terry Ikumi, Channels Television News. Now let's take a deeper look at the resumption of the National Assembly and the task ahead of them. Joining me live from Abuja is the convener, National Political Equity Movement, and the legislative analyst, Mr. Chibuzo Ikurike. Thank you so much for joining us on the News at 10. Thank you. Good evening. Good evening to you as well. Uh, many are already saying that the National Assembly should hit the ground running and get to work, uh, particularly with the amendment bill. What do you think sh should be the fastest way of correcting the cross-referencing errors that everyone is talking about in good enough time? Uh, thank you. I, I think that uh, from tomorrow, we should have the leadership of the National Assembly resolve uh, to you know, kick of uh, the process of ensuring that the amendment I is done because I don't believe that uh, uh, a direct primary should be compulsory for political parties. If you do that, are you also going to make membership of political parties compulsory? So when they resume tomorrow, I uh, expect that the leadership should quickly take legislative action to ensure that the direct uh, issue of direct primary is resolved and the bill is a clean copy of the bill is quickly you know handled between the both chambers and transmitted uh, to the president for assent this is very important because as the, as it said uh, judiciary is the last hope of the common man but the legislature is the first hope of the common man so setting the right legislative agenda and the policy framework to drive electoral process is critical and you know that elections are the only platform through which the citizens showcase their sovereignty. It's actually not just for purposes of electing leaders, but also for accountability. It's a time that elected officials go back to the people for assessment and they bring them back or reject them through their vote. So getting the electoral act very quickly is very important. And I expect that the, there should be a supplementary order paper tomorrow that will have that uh, in the, on the agenda of the National Assembly. So okay, that let, we let can me, let quickly me... dispatch with this. Yeah. Yes, I was just going to say, indeed, um, it, it ought to be quickly dispatched with us. Everybody has, has been saying there. But this issue of direct primaries, is, is it a deal breaker when you look at it? I mean, just in terms of if it isn't expunged, for instance, what happens to the bill? Well, there, there are options uh, that uh, it could be there, but it should be, you know, optional. <laughs> but the president, in, 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 uh, in his uh, rejection letter, uh, asked the National Assembly, I think in a recent interview otherwise, said that they should include consensus candidate or what have you. We must understand that a piece of legislation does not seek to satisfy personal interests and opinion of people. We must live above board. Yes, this is an election, uh, you know, election period. There are a lot of activities going on, but we have a country to protect and safeguard. And having a proper electoral piece of legislation is critical to having the kind of leaders, having the voices of the people heard. So the option could be there, but not to make it mandatory, because you cannot legislate morality. It is something that requires education, advocacy, and the people in, uh, inclusiveness and participation. Because the idea that if you have compulsory uh, uh, primary, uh, direct primary, that you have solved problem of internal democracy is not absolutely correct. And we must uh, look at the future, look at uh, you know bigger picture beyond the activities of today. All right, the convener, National Political Equity Movement and Legislative Analyst, Mr. Chibuzo Okereke. Thanks a lot for joining us on the News at 10 tonight. Thank you.
In part two, after the break, Progressive Governors Forum Chairman Atiku Bagudu confirms February dates for the APC National Convention. That's in a moment. Do join us again. Welcome back. If you've just joined us, you're watching the news at 10 on Channel's television, coming to you live from Lagos. A reminder of our top stories. PDP governors ask National Assembly to consider overriding the president's veto of the Electoral Act Amendment Bill 2021 or delete areas of complaint by President Buhari. Progressive Governors Forum Chairman Atiku Bagudu confirms APC National Convention will take place next month. The federal government files fresh charges, including terrorism, against the detained leader of the prescribed indigenous people of Biafra, Nandekano, as his trial resumes tomorrow. And trial of suspects involved in the invasion of Supreme Court Justice Mary Odili's home begins in Abuja as prosecution calls first witness. Let's take a look at some more politics. The Progressive Governors Forum says the planned February convention of the All Progressives Congress will hold as scheduled. The chairman of the forum and governor of Kirby State, Atiku Wagudu, stated this at the end of its closed-door meeting in Abuja on Sunday night. The exact date of the convention, according to the forum, will be made known by the caretaker committee of the party. Meanwhile, Governor Bagudu says that governors passed the vote of confidence on the caretaker committee led by Yobe State Governor Maimala Buni. We spoke about our unanimous appreciation of Mr. President and especially the confidence he has in the forum. And we also passed a vote of confidence on the National Caretaker and Extraordinary Convention Planning Committee of the party chaired by Governor Mai Malabuni and including two other governors, among others, Governor Abu Bello of Nasarawa State and Governor Boyega, South Niger, Governor Boyega Oyetola of Oshun State, who have done an incredible job of running our party successfully, mobilizing people into the party. And we are very, very happy with their conduct. We discussed our oncoming convention, which you may recall, uh, I had cause to address the press after we visited with Mr. President in November, where we expressed that both Mr. President and the party have indicated, have agreed that the convention will take place in February. February is still realistic. Yes. Oh, yeah. when, when, when February is Under our, Mr. we are one, group of stakeholders in the party and our party respects institutions the appropriate organ of the party is the national caretaker committee that will announce a date the former governor of Borono state kashim shetima and the former secretary to the government of the federation babachir lawal are leading the campaign to solicit support for the presidential ambition of former Lagos State Governor Chief Bola Tinubu. Speaking at a conference of Tinubu support groups in Abuja, the supporters say Chief Tinubu is currently the most qualified candidate in the ruling All Progressives Congress to replace President Buhari in 2023. Some prominent members of the ruling All Progressives Congress, APC, and leaders of various support groups in the party converge on the main hall of the International Conference Center in Abuja to drum support for Senator Bola Tinubu's presidential ambition. Although several individuals within the APC have declared intentions to contest for the presidential seat ahead of the party's primaries, this gathering is interested in the massive mobilization of members to ensure the emergence of Senator Tinubu as the party's presidential candidate. We must continue to recruit people. Let's not just assume we've had enough. Let's continue to recruit people. At the state level, recruit more people. At the local government level, recruit more, uh, more people. 
A former governor of Borno State, Alhaji Kashim Shatima, is also among those leading this political movement, and he predicates his stance on the belief that the former governor of Lagos State is the most qualified candidate in the party to replace the president, Muhammadu Buhari, in 2023. As you are stand on your opinion. They are proof of the qualities this country needs to redeem its past potentials and possibilities. The president of Nigeria in 2023 will have excellent economic management capabilities. Speaking against the backdrop of the challenges confronting the ruling party and how this has impeded their performances, the former secretary to the government of the Federation insists on the need to support Tinubu to change the narrative. Since forming government at the center and in many states across the Federation for the past seven and a half years, the objective of building a cohesive and varied political party has eluded the leadership of the party. This is the current state of our party, and it is in this environment that we are gathered here must operate to produce Senator Ahmed Bola Tunubu as the party's flag bearer at the 2023 presidential election. Since Senator Bola Tinubu's declaration to contest for the presidential seat last week, several other prominent members of the ruling party have also declared their intentions to run for the office. But the decision on who will fly the party's presidential flag will ultimately be determined by members of the party during their primaries. We cross over to our Abuja studios. Here's Linda Akigbe. Linda? Hello, Ijoma. Now let's go from politics to efforts at curbing the spread of COVID-19. The Federal Capital Territory Administration, FCTA, has commenced enforcement of the order on no vaccination card or proof of negative test results, no entry into public facilities. The exercise comes more than a month after the federal government began the enforcement of the same order in December of last year. Our correspondent, Emperor Simon, reports. Staff of the federal government hanging around the premises of the Federal Capital Territory Administration Secretariat at the Garki Area 11 part of the nation's capital. On a normal day, they should be in their offices at the early hours of the day. But security men are manning the gate of the facility to enforce the directive by the FCT administration that only persons with COVID-19 vaccination card or proof of COVID-19 negative test result obtained within 72 hours can be allowed access. Every person is required to show their vaccination card and identity card before they are allowed entry and those without the documents are turned back. The federal government have announced this late last year. FCTA commenced its own enforcement after, after giving due time, and some persons, we are not vaccinated here. And we felt that was not right. Even if you're not going to be vaccinated and you feel that, then get us a negative COVID test result. Across FCTA-owned offices here, if you are not vaccinated, you don't have a COVID-19 uh, uh, negative test result, then you won't be allowed in. However, some of the civil servants claim they were not adequately notified. We are not being informed. So we, for us to come here this morning to see this kind of situation, we are very, very surprised. Understand? So they should just give us some time so that we can get ourselves prepared for it. But the aid to the FCT minister debunks the claim. If you check all the media houses, the circular was carried last year by the Office of the Head of Civil Service of the Federation to all federal civil servants, of which the FCTA is part of it, the FCT minister and the, the FCT, FCTA, through the permanent secretary and uh, the Director of Human Resource, issued a circular again on Sunday and Monday, which was sent around all of them and carried again in the media, heavily reported. As the exercise continues, some of the civil servants are however taking advantage of the mass vaccination exercise going on just meters away from the secretariat. 
The federal capital territory has the second highest figure of COVID-19 cases in Nigeria with over 27,000 confirmed cases and 241 deaths recorded as of January 17, 2022. Emperor Simon, Channels Television News. Still ahead on the news at 10, House of Reps Speaker Femi Bajabi Amila calls for a review of the minimum educational requirement to contest political office. Plus, Nigeria's inflation rate hits over 15%, recording its first increase after eight months of decline. That's in business news. Join us again. Welcome back to the news at 10, coming to you live from Abuja. To the judiciary, less than 24 hours to the scheduled commencement of accelerated hearing in the trial of a detained leader of the proscribed indigenous people of Biafra, Namdikanu. The federal government has filed fresh charges against him, including terrorism. In the amendment process, it filed before the federal high court in Abuja. The federal government increased the counts. The IPOB leader, who is facing a seven-count treasonable felony charge, will now enter his fresh plea to a 15-count amended charge. The court had, on December the 2nd last year, fixed Tuesday, January the 18th, to hear some pending applications, including the one filed by Kanu seeking to be discharged and acquitted. The trial of the 15 suspects who allegedly laid siege to the home of Supreme Court Justice, Justice Mary Odili's home last year, has commenced at the Federal High Court sitting in Abuja. The remaining three persons who were unable to get their bail at the last sitting got reprieve as a trial judge, Justice Nkonye Maha, granted them bail in the sum of 5 million naira and two shurettes each in like sum. The trial of the 15 suspects who allegedly laid siege on the residence of the Supreme Court Justice, Justice Mary Odili, begins at the Federal High Court sitting in Abuja. Before the commencement of the trial, the three suspects who are yet to secure their bail as of the last adjourned date moved their bail application, which the court granted. The prosecution counsel then proceeds to call his first witness, Mr. Madaki Chidawa, an assistant police officer attached to Justice Odili. He narrates what transpired on the day of the siege. He identifies two of the defendants who were in court as the persons who came with a search warrant to the residence of the justice. He says the warrant read number nine Emo Street, while the residence of Justice Mary is number seven Emo Street. Mr. Chidawa told the court that he was accused by the leader of the team, Lawrence Ajodu, of obstructing justice when he insisted that the residence of Justice Dodili is number seven. You saw what he said in court. I cannot see what he saw because we are still under trial. It will be so judicious for me to start saying what my witness saw. This guy has given evidence today. If not because, if not because the other counsel says he's not ready to go on with the cross-examination, we could have known what to do without his statement. The trial judge, Justice Nkonye Maha, subsequently adjourned the suit to March 1st for cross-examination of the witnesses. The Supreme Court has reversed its earlier decision, which dismissed an appeal by a guarantee trust bank, GTB, against a 2.4 billion naira judgment given in favor of Innocent Motors Nigeria Limited by the Court of Appeal in Ibadan, Oyo State. A judgment delivered by a five-member panel led by Justice Olukayode Ariwola unanimously held that the Supreme Court erred when, in the ruling on February the 27th, 2019, dismissed the appeal filed by GTB. In the lead judgment written by Justice Dijani Abubaka, the court held that it was misled by its registry, which failed to promptly bring to the notice of the panel that sat on the case that GTB had already filed its appellant's brief of argument. The judgment was an, on application by GTB, seeking the relisting of the appeal on the grounds that it was wrongly dismissed. 
Relying on Order 8, Rule 16 of the Supreme Court's rules, Justice Abubakar, in the lead judgment, held that the Apex Court has the power to set aside its decision in certain circumstances as any other courts. And that's all from Abuja. Back to you, Ijoma. Thanks a lot, Linda. As discussions continue on the reforms needed to ensure an improved political system, the Speaker of the House of Representatives, Femi Bajabi Amila, is calling for a review of Section 131, Subsection D of the 1999 Constitution. The section sets the minimum qualification for a candidate seeking public office at senior school certificate level, a provision the Speaker wants reviewed upward. Honorable Bajabi Amila made this call at the University of Lagos 52nd Convocation Lecture today. It's the 52nd Convocation Lecture of the University of Lagos, holding at the JF Adeajai Hall in a convivial atmosphere. Distinguished leaders of thought, including Justice Amina Augi of the Supreme Court and the institution's pro-Chancellor, Senator Larry Tejushu, and members of the university's Senate file into the auditorium as the event begins. <laughs> Setting the tone for the day's proceedings, the Vice-Chancellor, Professor Tonyo Gundikwe, highlights the achievements of the university's management in the areas of infrastructure development and students' welfare. We have other projects that we have been able to attract. The one from Chief Kesintin at Debutu, who has been able to assist us with 200 million naira to, for, to improve on our internet facilities and make our internet to be friendly and for the usage of the student. Emphasizing the importance of education, chairperson of the lecture, Justice Augie, calls on the Speaker of the House of Representatives, who is also the guest lecturer, to walk the talk while he still holds office. I have put uh, the Honorable Speaker, uh, that is reminding him that he's not just going to tell us what he's going to tell us, he's also going to make sure that what he tells us by the time he leaves that National Assembly, the book is on there. Like I told him right now, I mean, it's under your watch. Everything going on in this country is right under your watch. Speaker of the Federal House of Representatives. Honorable Bajabi Amila in his lecture titled Building Back Better, Creating a Framework for Tertiary Education in Nigeria in the 21st Century, describes the current approach to funding tertiary education as unsustainable. A well-structured student loan system is one way to do this. In the National Assembly, we're working on the student's loan access to higher education bill, which I sponsored. <laughs> this bill will establish the framework for providing interest-free loans to students with repayment of these loans beginning two years after the completion of the National Youth Service and spread over time. The speaker also used the occasion to draw attention to the 2023 presidential election and the need for education-based reforms. We cannot, on one hand, be talking about raising the standard of education in Nigeria, and on the other hand, requiring the barest minimum for those who will govern us. This provision is a product of a different time and reflects the reality of that time. After the disruptions brought on by the COVID-19 pandemic in 2020 and the leadership row over the powers of the University Governing Council in the same year, the institution may have got off on a strong pedestal with the 52nd Convocation Lecture, signifying the successful completion of the last academic year. Bukola Samuel Wemimo for Channels Television News. Let's take a look at some business news now. Here's Anne Waudu. Thank you, Ijoma. Let's begin business news with Nigeria's inflation rate. It has risen to 15.63% for December from 15.4% it was in November 2021. And this is amid rising food prices. 
According to data obtained from the Nigeria Bureau of Statistics, this marks the first increase after eight months of steady decline since April 2021. That report also shows that food inflation increased to 17.37% in December, coming from 17.21% recorded in November last year, while core inflation rose from 13.85% in November to 13.87% in December. Meanwhile, urban inflation rate rose and slowed by 16.17%, while rural inflation rate fell to 15.11% year on year. Visa is creating an unforgettable experience for its customers using its partnership with the Confederation of African Football as the exclusive digital payment service provider for the Afghan 2021. The company says that it is looking to further help expand access to financial system in Africa. Africa's flagship football competition, the 2021 Africa Cup of Nations, is underway in Cameroon with its unique glamour and excitement. Visa, the exclusive digital payment service provider of the competition, marks this year's edition by creating new one-of-a-kind experiences for cardholders and football fans. It goes at the 2002 and 2004 AFCON. Two things we want to achieve in this year. Um, one is the fact that we continue to lead in the payment space and we definitely want to be able to utilize this somewhat to bring in the unbanked. Uh, one thing you would know is that Nigerians love football, Africans love football, so we're leveraging this Afghan asset to be, to be able to bring in even the unbanked into the space. The second thing we also want to do is that what with the success of what we've done in football sponsorships, we're now utilizing this as well to bring in the best of experiences, similar to what we're doing tonight. So we're, we're creating a viewing center, we've brought in our partners, we've brought in our clients, we've brought in our consumers, we've brought in different participants across the industry, and everybody's here together just having a great time um, and you know, experiencing AFCON you know, life in Lagos. 2021. Visa explains its outlook for 2022 as it seeks to create unique and unforgettable experiences for cardholders and football fans. The world is evolving and is evolving into non-frictionless um, forms of payment and for us it's contactless. Um, the market is ready for it, um, consumers are yearning for it. Um, in the past few months, we've been working with both our partners and also the central bank to ensure that the ecosystem is ready to be able to adopt the contactless form of payments. So it's an exciting period for us because we know that 2022 is going to expand the opportunities of the payment space, particularly from a contactless payment standpoint. The benefits of contactless essentially is frictionless payments, where it helps the consumers to move quicker in the queue because it's just the form of tapping on a POS machine and moving on. Say visa! Visa! The company says it will continue to connect football's most passionate and engaged audiences in Africa through its powerful payment network. Now to the equities market where it opened the week on a negative note. Any John Mekwa has the details. Thank you so much. Welcome to the Stock Market Report. Well, losing the winning streak is started at the intraday. The NGX closed with bearish sentiments on the first trading day of this week, costing investors about 30 billion naira. Well, not so much after closing two weeks in the green. Nonetheless, it was a bearish trade. <laughs> Now the All Share Index shed 0.12% and the market cap still within the 23.9 trillion Naira. And uh, it's just the deals that made it to the green. It was up almost 14% at 4,410. Now let's look at movement of the counters. Banking was down 0.08%. A lot of sell-offs seem to have occurred on GT Co, which shed five cover from its share price. Consumer goods was up 0.20%. Is drove this with one naira 30 couple added to its share price. What they have noted today is Boa Foods. It had its first decline since it was listed on the 5th of January. It shed four naira 20 couple from its share price. Now let's look at industrial goods. It was up almost 1%. It was actually the star of the day, uh, up almost 1%. The investors were drawn to Boa Cement. 
opposite of what happened on Boa Food. It added one naira fifty cover to a share price to close at seventy naira. Top trades by volume had Transcor, FBN Holding, and GT Co. Those were the three top trades, and they accounted for almost ninety million of the shares traded today. Well, it's a new week. We'll keep following the market and following the money. That's the stock market report. I'm Ine John Mekwa. And that's business news for tonight. Thank you for watching. I'm Anne Mwawadu. The rest of the news at 10 continues now with Ijoma. Banking so easy, so simple. Dial star 894 hash now to experience it. You first, first bank. Thanks a lot, Anne. At least seven people have been killed in the Sudanese capital after security forces fired live bullets on thousands of protesters marching towards the presidential palace. Media reports say several civilians were seen bleeding on the streets after security forces fired tear gas to block protesters from approaching the palace. Song Mpuzi has more international news in Around the World in Five. Good evening and welcome to the Channel Studios here in London with your international news around the world in five. Significant damage has been reported after a tsunami hit the Pacific Island nation of Tonga, but communication problems are making getting the full picture difficult. These satellite images from space show the extent of the volcano eruption on Sunday. Ash billowed out of the Hunga Tonga Hunga Haapai volcano, which is about 65 kilometers north of the capital. So far, there have been no confirmed reports there of injuries or deaths, but internet and telephone communications are extremely limited, and outlying coastal areas remain cut off, leaving the real scale of the damage unclear. Two people have drowned off a beach in northern Peru after unusually high waves were recorded in several coastal areas. New Zealand and Australia have dispatched surveillance flights to assess the damage. Two teenagers have been arrested in England as part of an investigation into a hostage-taking incident at a synagogue in Texas. British citizen Malik Faisal Akram from Blackburn was shot dead after a standoff with police in Coleyville in Texas. Earlier on Saturday, an FBI hostage rescue team stormed the synagogue. Here footage of the final three remaining hostages running through a fire escape. This was an act of terror. This was an act of terror. Speaking on Sunday, President Joe Biden thanked local authorities and the FBI. Novak Djokovic has arrived back home in Serbia after being deported from Australia. Mobile phone footage showed the tennis star walking through the airport in Belgrade. Serbian fans gathered at the airport chanting his name. The top men's player was deported on Sunday after losing a visa battle that centred on the fact that he is unvaccinated. Police in Kenya have termed alarmist a viral video of school kids lying down in a classroom to avoid gunfire. The video posted on social media shows students frantically seeking to hide under desks, tables and chairs as shots ring out. But security leaders in the area say the attack was happening more than one kilometre away from the school. Tensions remain high in Kenya's North Rift region along the Kerio Valley, where a series of banditry attacks have taken place regularly for several months. Former Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu is thought to be negotiating a plea deal which could end his corruption trial. An agreement could see Mr Netanyahu plead guilty to reduce charges in return for community service instead of a possible jail term. Reports say Mr Netanyahu is, however, objecting to accept a charge which would require him to leave politics. A major winter storm has brought heavy snow and ice to parts of the US and Canada, putting more than 80 million people under weather warnings. More than 145,000 people are without power in some southern states and thousands of flights have been cancelled. Virginia, Georgia and North and South Carolina have all declared states of emergency. The U.S. National Weather Service says more than one foot of snow is expected in some areas, which could result in dangerous travel, power outages and tree damage. 
The pandemic has made the world's wealthiest far richer, but has led to more people living in poverty. That's according to the charity Oxfam. Lower incomes for the world's poorest contributed to the deaths of 21,000 people each day, its report claims. Yes, well, you'll notice... But according to the charity, the world's 10 richest men, which include Amazon founder Jeff Bezos and Tesla CEO Elon Musk, have more than doubled their collective fortunes since March 2020. Amazon has dropped plans to block UK Visa credit card payments this week as the two sides continue to try to resolve a dispute over payment fees. The expected change regarding the use of Visa credit cards on Amazon will no longer take place on January the 19th, that's according to Amazon. Visa said it was working closely to reach an agreement. Amazon said last year that Visa payment costs were an obstacle to providing the best prices for customers. And finally, the first day of the Spring Festival travel season has kicked off in China despite sporadic outbreaks of COVID-19 across the country. Over 1.18 billion trips are expected to be made during the travel rush. China's largest annual travel period, also known as Chunyun, will last until February the 25th. Many Chinese people will travel to meet their families for the Chinese Lunar New Year or Spring Festival, which falls on February the 1st. And that's your international news around the world in five. Now back to the Channel Studios in Lagos. Welcome to Sports News. Cameroon and Burkina Faso have both advanced to the round of 16 at the African Cup of Nations after finishing first and second, respectively, in Group A. Cameroon were forced to a 1-1 draw by Cape Verde after conceding a late equaliser. The result meant the indomitable Lions ended the group phase with seven points from three matches and finished in first place. A similar scenario played out in the game between Burkina Faso and Ethiopia, with the game ending 1-1 after Ethiopia scored an equalizer from the penalty sport early in the second half. Burkina Faso finished with four points, same as, as Cape Verde, but edged out the Central African catchy of the head-to-head -head rule. Pierre-Emerick Aubameyang has been released from Gabon's African Cup of Nations squad and will return to Arsenal because of the striker's ongoing health issues. The 32-year-old missed Gabon's draw with Ghana on Friday after scans revealed heart lesions following a bout of COVID. Aubameyang tested positive on arrival in Cameroon on January 6 and will undergo further medical checks upon his return to Arsenal. And to other stories, Bayern Munich and Poland striker Robert Lewandowski has been named 2021 Best FIFA Men's Player of the Year. Lewandowski claimed the award for the second consecutive year after scoring 69 goals. The 33-year-old beat Paris Saint-Germain's Lionel Mercy and Liverpool's Mohamed Salah to the first prize. Barcelona's Alexia Putzilas won the best female... Thank you very much. And that'll be all in sports. Back to you, Ijoma. Thanks a lot, Chris. And the main news again. PDP governors today asked the National Assembly to consider overriding the President's veto of the Electoral Act Amendment Bill 2021 or delete errors of complaint by President Buhari. That's the news at 10 tonight. Thanks a lot for staying with us. I'm Ijoma Rinyato. Good night.